Awesome. Well, it is on the hour. We have a super jam-packed session today, so we better get it going, get started. So hello again. Welcome. If you're just joining in, feel free to pop in chat where you're dialing in from. We love to see all of those. Today's topic is around um, building the employee experience. And what we've really been hearing from the community is that there's just lots of change going on right now and that it would just be super great for everyone to get together and talk about how to navigate through all of that. And so we've invited Jeff and Lori here today to join in on the conversation. And I'll do a proper introduction for them a little bit from now. But for now, all I'll say is that I'm really excited to hear what they all have to say from this topic, from their really unique perspectives. So really quickly, today's session is brought to you by Bucket List Rewards, which is the number one re employee rewards and recognition platform. And in partnership with us here today, Within People, as well as Goalspan. So Lori's from Within, and his, he and his team help leaders grow their companies through purpose-led and values-driven culture, as well as leadership. And we have Jeff here with us today from Goalspan. He and his team have built a fantastic industry-leading feedback, goal-setting, and performance assessment platform. And then quick introductions about ourselves. So hello, I'm Rebecca. I'm your host here today. I'm the community manager here at Bucklist Rewards. And I'm just super passionate about helping companies build happy and rewarding workplace cultures where we can all thrive and have a good time. And I organize our Bucket List community webinar program. And I'm just super excited to be diving into this topic of employee experience with all of you here today. And our mission with these events is really to bring the latest thought leadership to our community and provide a space for everyone, culture leaders, to ask questions and share thoughts and experiences. A little bit about me outside of work, I really enjoy paddle boarding, hiking, reading, and enjoying the food scene here in Vancouver. And now I'm really excited to introduce these two lovely individuals with me here today. First up, Lori, he is the co-founder of Within People, a global team of growth strategists and coaches who work at the intersection of culture, brand, and strategy. And he's really just spent the last 15 years helping a new generation of more purposeful, equitable organizations grow. And he does that from the forested slopes of North Vancouver, where he lives with his young family. And Jeff here, he's the president and CEO of Goalspan a performance management company in the San Francisco Bay Area. And Jeff has had a really multifaceted career running both public and private companies, as well as selling, acquiring, merging numerous businesses and assisting his clients to do the same. Jeff's currently serving on several corporate boards and he is the host of an awesome podcast that you should all check out, Human Capital Podcast. And with that podcast, he's just really on a mission to uncover the deeply human aspect of work. And in his spare time, he's an avid sailor and hiker. Awesome. Well, now that you all know a little bit more about us, we'd love to get to know all of you a little bit better. And so in the spirit of employee experience, let's just kick things off with this fun little icebreaker. So what's the most interesting employee experience initiative you've seen so far in 2023? Feel free to share with us in the chat box. Um, as people are thinking, Jeff, did you want to start this one off? Sure. Thanks, Rebecca. And thanks so much for that just uh, welcoming introduction. And welcome, everybody. So glad you could all join us today. Yeah, employee experience is becoming so much more important than it was previously. And it feels like a very uh, quickly evolving space. And so I think what I'm most interested right now is how AI is going to influence the employee experience in organizations. Uh, there's lots of new initiatives and technologies and people are using it in different ways. And so I'm sitting on the sidelines as an observer, just really curious and interested about how that's going to affect how we all live and work uh, and how we interact with each other in the workplace. So that's the first thing that comes to mind for me. Yeah, amazing. And AI is definitely a huge thing right now. <laughs> and how about yourself, Lori? Any fun or cool initiatives you've seen so far? Um, so many, I think <clears throat> that 
if you'd asked a few years ago what was an employee experience initiative, I think people would have scratched their heads a little bit, think, what does that mean and what are we talking about? Um, whereas I think now there's so much happening from that's connecting. I think for me, the really interesting stuff is how people are taking things that they used to do in their offices, in their kind of traditional work days and starting to reimagine how they do those kinds of things in remote and hybrid settings. I think the pandemic for all the challenge it brought was an amazing release of creativity for how we connect with each other, how we create experience around and with our work in new and exciting ways. Um, and I'm loving watching people find ways to be in connection with each other in really new and interesting circumstances. Totally. I see a couple of people joining in on this conversation. Michelle in the chat talking about goal setting theory as part of coaching and ment mentoring um, programs that they have. Any thoughts around that? I absolutely have thoughts around goal setting because that's what my company <laughs> does. And uh, what's interesting is that organizations and people that set goals and they really manage them and they pay attention to them um, are much more intentional. And the experience becomes better for employees because it makes you really feel like you're contributing and you're growing and you're making progress and you check in regularly and you know how you fit in. So it's a little sneak peek on some of the things that I'm going to be talking about, but uh, I love that concept, and I think it's going to continue to get a much greater foothold in organizations that really want to succeed and accomplish big picture things together. So I appreciate that post. Amazing. Yeah. And Barry here talked about how their company provides a private label concierge assistant service designed for all employees within the organization. Love that's for employees and not just for customers, which is great. Um, Jen talks about um, building a virtual office for people to get together, which is really important. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for sharing. Feel free to do so, of course, throughout the rest of this session here. We'd love to just weave in whatever your thoughts are in with the discussions that we're currently having. So without further ado, I will go over the agenda for today. So as um, I've kind of hit, we've kind of hinted in promotions going out for this event, um, the format for this session, we were trying for something a little bit different just to shake things up. So we're very curious to hear how you feel about it. But we'll be kicking things off with a fireside chat, which we're hoping for more of a group discussion with everyone here about defining employee experience, what exactly does it mean to us? And then we have two mini presentations today, all chock full of awesome takeaways and strategies and concepts from both Lori and Jeff. And lastly, we'll just wrap it all up with um, the professional development credits, as well as the key takeaways and the Q&A. So last thing I promise, a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. For the chat box, I know we, we're all kind of using it now, but just a really quick reminder that for the, the blue drop down thing is kind of selected to everyone if it's a comment you want everyone to be interacting with. And for the Q&A, if you have a question that you would like answered at the end, please pop it into the Q&A button so we don't lose it in the chat. The poll questions, all the answers will be aggregated. And the last thing, the professional development credits, as well as the session recording, will also be sent out um, in the emails after coming out after the event. So without further ado, let's get started with our fireside chat. So... What does employee experience mean to you and how would you define it? I'm going to kick this one off to Lori first. Yeah, I think, like I mentioned just now, I think this term sort of been knocking around for a little while, um, but and has meant various different things over the last few years. But what's what it really means for me right now in the way that we think about it within is that the employee experience is really what it feels like to be a part of your culture um how your culture actually feels in the day-to-day -day. and it's kind of a an a, an experience that you have as a collective as all the people inside an organization what it should and what you want and what you hope the experience of of working and being part of this culture feels like but it's also a very individual experience that people feel in different ways depending on who they are in the, in the 
setup that you have. And I think there's there's something really interesting for me about the dynamic between the experience we have as individuals inside companies and that collective experience we hope to have together. Amazing. And um, Jeff, what about you? Yeah, I love that definition, Laurie. It makes so much sense. And I, I also love a definition from actually somebody that I had the opportunity to interview on my podcast. Her name is Jean Meister, and she's a researcher and does a lot in the area of employee experience. And she basically says that employee experience is the sum total of all of the experiences that an employee has with their employer over the course of the duration of their relationship. So this is everything from recruiting and applicant tracking to onboarding to once we are onboarded, how are we communicating with our manager? How frequently is that? Is the company good at talking about big picture and where we're going as an organization? And then is it, are they taking care of people both personally and professionally uh, from a uh, incentive and comp standpoint and from all other aspects that they value in their lives. And so what's interesting too is on this question, it's like employee experience is actually defined outside the organization by the employee. So what's the benchmark? It's really the experience that employees are having from other companies that they connect with. So when they go get serviced by somebody really well at Southwest Airlines, or when they're purchasing something, that sort of defines what they expect from their employer as well. And um, that includes with the ways we interact with each other and all of these holistic things sort of come together to create that employee experience. I love that you're talking about sort of putting a focus on the whole person and not just, you know, who someone is at work, because of course we never leave our personal stuff at the door when we come to work. And so it's really, I'm so happy to hear you talk about this holistically. Yeah, and does anybody else here today have a, something they'd like to share about the meaning of employee experience to them? I see in the chat, Sydney, thank you for sharing. Employee experience means, you know, feeling supported, having a positive environment to work in, feeling, vol feeling valued and having strong communications. These are such great pieces. Any any thoughts on that, Jeff and Lori? I'd, I'd, just to build on what Jeff was saying there, I heard a good description the other day, which is imagine it as being the, the average of your last thousand interactions within your company. Kind of that's really what your culture and the experience of being there looks like. It's this, it's the climate of your company rather than the weather. It's the, that kind of sense of over time, what does it really feel like and mean to be a part of this organization and this culture? And there's something interesting about the consistency that that asks for when you're thinking about it in that way. Yeah, I, I love that. And I really resonate with Sydney's comment as well, because I feel like uh, in what you said, Rebecca, about it being about the person, not just the 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 production of the role or the job. You cannot separate these two. And there's actually a benefit to knowing and learning and understanding people and what they value and what they care about. The other thing that I would add, and, and by the way, if we know more about them personally, it's more likely they're going to perform better professionally. Um, so I think that's key. The other thing that I would add is the importance of overlaying core values with employee experience. So if we've done a really good job defining what behaviors are really important to us as an organization, and then we support and promote those very well, it's gonna to lead to a better employee experience. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that it's really like a muscle, you have to flex it constantly. You can't give up on this thing or it's gonna atrophy and pretty soon, pretty soon you're gonna be out of shape. I love how metaphorical you both are and how great your analogies are it really helps paint that picture and I think a great um thing to end off with here Bev and Emily's comments in the um, comment section about how employee experience is what you choose to create influence for people in the workplace as well as 
how it feels like to be part of a community at work. And I think those are really beautiful pieces to end off this fireside chat with. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts and participating. Now I'd love to just welcome to our center stage here, Lori. Um, Lori, I know in a previous conversation, you mentioned that a really big thing for you when it comes to employee experience is just bringing experiences and expectations together in a way that's really meaningful for people. And I think that's just such a great segue into your little presentation here today titled Promises, Not Perks, How to Design an Employee Experience That's Fit for the Future. And for all of you in the audience here today, I was lucky enough to get a sneak peek from Lori and no spoilers here, but he has some really great examples and strategies to share. So I'm just going to pass it over to you now, Lori, to kick things off. Thank you. I'm inspired by the stage. I feel like a sort of a dance might be appropriate here, but knowing how I dance, maybe that's not such a good idea. Um, right. So, yeah, you can actually ping me right on to the next one if you want, uh, please, Rebecca. So what I wanted to talk about today in the context of employee experience was the, the kind of underlying question for me, which is how do you intentionally live your culture in a way that works for everyone as the way we work continues to change? I think in our my work with leaders and organizations of all sectors and sizes around the world, this is a really salient question right now. There's a lot of change going on. There's a lot of uncertainty that comes with that change. There are real questions about how does a culture survive and thrive and help people to do that inside their organization in the face of what's happening. Um, so <clears throat> one more slide, please, Becca. Oh, one back. Thank you. So the context for this is really interesting right now. I think I mentioned before that employee experience is a a term that has a lot of currency right now, but that's not been the case for a really long time, for such a long time. I think what's really clear right now is that the world of work is fundamentally changing. The pandemic did more than just cause us to ask questions about where and when we work. It's caused us to ask fundamental questions about how work shows up in our lives, not just whether we work inside offices or outside, which is a huge, debate right now that we're seeing lots of leaders wrangling with the decision about where to have people work, how to control or let go of the when people work. Um, we're, we're seeing a lot of questions surfacing around how does work really work for everyone? The pandemic again shone a light on what it means to restrict people's movement or give them the freedom to be able to balance their own priorities and their lives with the way that they work in a way that gives them much more responsibility to be able to shape that the way that they want it. Um, and how to balance those kinds of freedoms with the challenges around maintaining performance and productivity inside businesses and actually discovering whole new relationships between those things that I think a lot of leaders have found surprising about when you give people that freedom, what that does to inspire productivity rather than I think before that time, this feeling of we really need to control the way people work to make sure that the productivity happens. Um, and I think there's a heap of change that's accelerating out in the world now from, you know, we've had pandemics, recessions, inflation, devaluation, Jeff mentioned AI, the, the pace of the change that business is having to operate in and employees are having to work within is speeding up. So on please, Rebecca, I think at the heart of that conversation, we're seeing employee experience show up. And you know, for me, that's not really surprising because employee experience is concerned with really how we understand what's expected of us and how we show up to the work that we have to do. Um, the term employee experience has become incredibly popular lately. It's in the last five years, we're seeing five times the use of the words in themselves. And I think when you start to think of employee experience as, as being a, the map through which you navigate change, it's the, the, the blueprint that we create for how we want to be as an organization. And when you are intentional about your employee experience, you're able to actually create that map and support people to move through change with something to guide them. 
it's become the currency for recruitment and retention inside businesses. We're seeing a huge surge in people wanting to search for meaningful work and to be able to work in the ways that work for them. And I think organizations that aren't thinking about their employee experience are missing out on this massive opportunity to be able to really engage with a, a workforce that wants something a little different right now. And I think our message into the world around this right now is that the work to be done with employee experience isn't about tweaking it and refining it. It's actually the opportunity right now to reimagine it completely and to redesign the way your organization works so that it works for everyone who's part of it right now. Um, starting to make work more meaningful, more equitable and more resilient to the change that's out there in the world. So how do we do that? Well, three things that I want to take you through today, losing the perks, making promises and living up to them. Um, the first one of those is about losing the perks, which is a little controversial, but there's something important about this because when we think about employee experience, we're inclined to think about initiatives and cool stuff, basically, that companies do to make the experience of working there more enjoyable. Rebecca, if you go one more slide on, please. And perks are a really fantastic incentive. They can be a brilliant reason to join one company over another. They can be a great incentive to inspire performance in a workforce. I'm talking about everything from promises around um, perks around paid time off, around um, discounts of the products that you sell for people who work with you, to Friday night drinks and socializing in the culture, to benefits packages and bonus packages that are there to, in, to kind of attract and bring people in and make that experience more rich. The trouble is if your employee experience is based around a set of perks that you offer, it's a bit like this car. That spoiler, spoiler alert, doesn't make that car go any faster. Um, it's a bolt on to the culture. It's a bolt on to the car. It's a bolt on to the culture is your is what your perks are. It doesn't make the car go faster. You hope it makes it look that way. Um, a slide in the office doesn't actually make work more meaningful. It makes it look that way. And it's been interesting to watch how perks have really shaped an employee experience. Um, and this arms race that's developed around being able to offer more and more extravagant perks. Um, Rebecca, the next slide, please. Um, into the marketplace. And it's turned into this slightly crazy world. And I think looking at big tech lately, this has been a really big part of what we've seen happen in that space where we've started to really work in under the sense that the bigger the perks we can offer, the more luxurious our employee experience can be and the more attractive it's going to be to potential applicants and the more persuasive it's going to be to support us to give our all and manage our performance in, in better ways. I think the problem here is that these kinds of perks are actually quite dangerous, much like these spoilers look like they might be a little dangerous for the cars that are being driven here. Because in my experience, the size of the perk correlates with the size of the ask that sits behind it. We're going to have sleep pods in the office and we're going to serve breakfast and have this beautiful Michelin starred lunch for you here, which means you don't leave the office. You stay here and do your work harder for us. There's an underlying intention that's not actually authentic to what's being communicated in that space. Um, and at worst, they actually start to form a problem with what we're able to do, because next slide. Rebecca, when we actually find ourselves in times of difficulty, the first thing that gets cut, the first thing that gets sacrificed are those, right? If I take the tech layoffs that have happened in 2023 as an example here with big tech, those perks were a symbol of the degree to which those companies would invest in their employees and their well being and their happiness. Who they then cut in their droves at the first signs of recession and challenges in the market. And those perks suddenly didn't matter anymore. When the pandemic hit, how cool your office was 
was no longer something that you could use to bring people into the way that you work because people weren't there anymore. What it showed was that when it comes to the crunch, employee experience needs to be about substance, not about style. And the substance of an employee experience is how meaningful you can make the work and how what sense of belonging you can create amongst a group of people around that work. That you can't use perks as a distraction from your employee experience. The employee experience has to be strong in and of itself. So what we really want to think about is, well, if we're going to say you can't have perks so much, what do we put there instead? And the answer to me here is that there, we need to make promises instead. So Rebecca, if you can click me on, that's perfect. When we start to think about what are the promises we're making rather than what are the perks we're offering, we're talking about what comes as standard rather than what are the aftermarket extras that we're adding to the experience of work. Promises are about commitment. They're not confetti. They are things that we can, the contracts that we make around the way that we want to be in relationship with each other. And they should be things that when we hit change and uncertainty, we don't discard because they're extras. We actually lean towards because they are the things that we have committed to together and that we intend to honor in the way that we work. And so my, my main idea here is that you, instead of, perks are great, but perks have to follow promises. And if you don't have the promises made, those perks will always seem like the bells and whistles. So what does an EX promise actually look like? How, what does a promise that defines an employee experience look like? Rebecca, one forward, please. There's a few things that really are important here. When you're making a promise around your employee experience, it's about establishing an expectation for how the relationship between an employee and an employer looks and feels. It has to be based on mutual value in that way. Here's some things that we will provide you with to support you to grow and be able to integrate your work into your life in the right way. And in return, here's what we expect from you in terms of how you're gonna support us in our mission towards achieving our purpose, towards fulfilling our um, vision and living our values. It should be about finding ways to create a more equitable way of working that actually starts to help everybody who's invested in this experience to feel valued in the way that they need to. It's got to feel like this is a strategic priority to us. We can see the value of doing this, not a tactical play. It's not something that we will drop when the going gets hard. It's something that we feel brings resilience to the way that we work. And it's gotta be something that's measured and backed up with proofs. So we've gotta be able to see it living and alive in the, in the organization at any time. So with that in mind, it's then like, well, what are the promises that we need to make? And within this framework for this, encourages leaders to think about making promises around four, through sort of looking at their experience through these four lenses, flexible, connected, rewarding, and growing. So what do those mean? Well, the first one is flexible, which is really asking us to think about how we collaborate remotely, creatively, inclusively, and flexibly. This is all about how do we really make promises that ensure that everyone's needs are heard and honored and that we're designing for flexibility in a way that's really aligned to what the needs of individuals around our business are, which is really tricky, especially in large businesses with a lot of people in them. And I think the debate that's out in the world now around hybrid working and should we let people work from home or should we bring them back into the office should start with a question of really understanding the different kinds of needs that exist in that space and what sorts of promises we make about how people use their time, about where they work and about how they work with each other that honor the flexibility that we need to be able to bring. That's not just about where do we work, but about how do we work in ways that enable everyone to work at their best. In terms of connected, um, the next one please, Rebecca. This is really about how we communicate, bring people together and drive inclusion. Here are the promises that you wanna be making around the ways that you create belonging, which isn't just about 
helping people connect with each other, but thinking about the ways that you make decisions, about the ways that you communicate around the organization and how that enables people to feel included and like they belong in the system that you're operating. The third one's around um, thinking about the, how we're recognizing people and creating and celebrating impact. Um, making promises, not just about how we pay people and reward them, but around how we give them opportunity to do meaningful work. And finally, about how we help people grow, how we're focused on balance and well-being and moving, um, helping balance growth and development alongside personal well-being. So with those promises in mind, how do you then live up to those promises? And the really important thing here is making sure that they're expectation you set through the promises you make echoes through into the experience that you actually create. And what that looks like, here, here's two very quick examples for you about what that can look like. In our own ex employee experience, um, Rebecca, next slide, please. In our own experience, employee experience, we've made a promise around flexibility that all needs are integrated to support the personal freedom of where, when, and how we work. And that echoes through into how we choose to use our time, which is that we use it in a way that works for us and that we can really integrate what's needed to service our clients, our partnership and our own commitments. And some concrete action that we've had to take out of that has been that we don't value time with our clients, that we actually value outcomes and we don't timesheet people based on the amount of time they spend doing things. We help them understand the outcomes that they want to work to, which fundamentally changes the way we're able to use time in the organization. Stoke, one of our clients on the next slide, has set a promise about growing, which is that people get to choose their own path and be supported to grow alongside a collective vision. What they've been doing there is reimagining then their personal development cycle from being something that felt like a ladder that you climbed to ascend levels of seniority to being something about how you can go and find skills within the business and start to kind of collect up a set of skills and experiences that enable you to pursue what you're most passionate about and help Stoke reach the vision that it's after. So in summary, moving quickly from, well, first of all, set the promises, move quickly to a plan for how you're going to create shifts inside your experience to honor those promises. That means aligning the process and rituals you've got in your businesses to do that and making that a measurable process, which I know Jeff's gonna talk about a little bit more too. And just remembering that through this, if you want an equitable outcome to this, it has to be an inclusive process. This is something to do with your employees, not for your employees. And I think the leaders that are really brave to leap into this kind of way of thinking about their employee experience, have the opportunity to really shift the way work feels and what it means to be at work for people today. And I think in that starting to echo that out into a wider society of what it means to exist in a more in inclusive, equitable and meaningful way with each other beyond that. And that is that. Awesome. Thank you. So much, Lori. Um, I know you got a couple of really great questions in the Q&A that we can, I'm really excited to tackle with you in our Q&A session. And a couple of people saying your slides are super descriptive. So thank you again, Lori, for sharing all of that. And just a quick reminder to the audience, um, we will be sending out the recording and the slides after in an email. So you'll have all of those for your perusal after the fact. All right, next up, join me in welcoming Jeff to center stage now. So Jeff, a few questions we had submitted to us prior to the session was really around optimizing the HR arsenal when it comes to improving employee experience and retention. And so I think that these questions are actually the perfect segue to just set up your talk and give you that runway. And so I'll just read out the questions here. So we got, how does performance management help with employee experience? And how can you use tools like goal setting, goal management, and feedback to impact the employee experience? And so to whoever of you in the audience who submitted these questions, Lots of great frameworks and strategies coming coming up, and I'm really excited to hear more from you, Jeff. I'll pass it over. Awesome, thank you, Rebecca, <clears throat> and thank you, Lori, for a great presentation. I love the concept of flexible, rewarding, growing, connected. Those are all so impactful when it comes to employee experience. So, also thank you, Rebecca, for those two questions. Uh, they're just perfectly 
uh, suited for my section, and I think they're going to be answered as we move along. And if they're if they're not, let's take a couple minutes at the end, and we'll go ahead and do that. <clears throat> so today, I'm going to talk about employee experience in the context of continuous performance management. And so, really, continuous performance management is where we've arrived today. And performance management is only one aspect of the employee's experience, but it's much more broad than most people give credit. And so I want to take some time today to sort of walk through different aspects of performance management that can actually become an incredibly valuable part of an employee's experience. So if we go back and we take a quick look at the history of what's happened with performance management and things like performance reviews. It goes all the way back more than 100 years ago when we first started documenting these things. And this whole concept of the ROI was born back in the 20s. And then fast forward up to, and by the way, in 1926, Ford adopted the five-day, 40-hour work week. So that sort of set the standard for, okay, what does performance management look like and how's it going to fit in? And then you get into the 50s, you have perform uh, sort of personality-based performance appraisals, which people shudder about that. Am I going to get a, a you know reviewed based on my personality? That doesn't sound very good. In the 60s, uh, management by objectives became very popular. This concept of MBO, or we're just going to manage by performance by objectives only. And then in the 70s, we had things like psychometrics and rating scales, and we all know that there's a lot of controversy around, do we use numerical ratings? Do we not use numerical ratings? Um, in the 70s, there were a lot of lawsuits around uh, subjectivity and bias, and that shifted things so that in the 80s, we adopted more multi-rater feedback systems like 360s. Um, and then in the more recent decades, like the, the 2000s and the 2010s, it was a little bit more engagement focused. There was a move away from the annual traditional performance review. And that really brings us up to the present, which is the, you know, in 2023, we're looking at continuous performance management. And so let's let's talk a little bit about that. So we've brought, we've been brought to this place now. So why do we need to change? Um, we're now in a place where there is a tremendous need to change because if you look at these historical processes, all these things that I just shared with you have produced very little effect on performance. In fact, I'll go as far as say that they have had a very negative impact on employee experience. Why is that? Because these traditional processes for an employee and often for a manager are anxiety producing. How many employees do you talk to that say, I love, I get to do performance reviews now. I'm going to do a self-assessment. This is so great. It's anxiety producing. Why? Because often there's surprises and there's bias that's baked into these processes. It's incredibly expensive in terms of time and money. Organizations are spending millions and millions of dollars every year with very little uh, benefit as a result. Um, what's the ultimate goal? It's really workforce alignment. We want to align everybody in the organization around what is most important. Let me tell you, my friends, that's an employee experience concept right there. If we align everyone around what's most important, that means we're all rowing in the same direction. We care about the same values. We care about where we're going as an organization, and we understand how we fit in. And so, the traditional processes have had very little workforce alignment. I want to give you a quick definition about this whole concept of continuous performance management. What am I talking about? It's really near-term goal setting. So this is something that is new for many people and organizations. They're used to, to doing the set it and forget it. I'm going to create my goals in January and I'm going to review them in December. Well, that just does not work. We need to create more near-term goals and we need to have bi-directional feedback. It's not that superior subordinate relationship. I'm peers. I'm The manager is a peer with the, the direct report. And we have bi-directional one-to-ones where we're talking about how I as a manager can support you better as an employee. 
and I'm listening to what's going on in your life, both personally and professionally. It's real-time feedback. So when things happen, we're in the moment. I'm able to give praiseworthy feedback, even in a remote environment. Like Lori was saying, there's been so much disruption with COVID and we're working in so many new and different ways. We can still give real-time feedback, both praiseworthy or constructive feedback when it's, when it's warranted. And all of this is implemented with a high degree of flexibility, which means we're not going to do a cookie cutter approach. Every personality is different and diversity is absolutely paramount as a result of our um, processes. And so let's embrace that diversity and develop systems and processes that fit well with each person and implement these with low formality and hierarchy. And then we're going to end up with a successful outcome. Okay, so what are the prerequisites for this? Before you really begin doing per continuous performance management, you have to have, you don't have to, but your results are gonna be much better if you have clearly defined your mission, your vision, and your core values. And then you support these with objectives that are at the corporate level, so everybody knows where we're, where we're going together. And then individually, how is my team and, and my own objectives, how are they going to support the long-term objectives of the company? So those will be my own personal goals. And when we think about mission, vision, and values, so those first three elements, what are they? Mission is what we do, who we do it for. And Rebecca, you can switch to the next slide and why it is important to either our employees, our customers, society. Why do we do these things? If employees know that, that's incredibly helpful. Even more importantly, if they know where we are going, what's an inspiring sentence or a couple of sentences which really tells them why I wanna be a part of this company? Where are we headed? And then I can better understand how my role contributes to that big picture vision in terms of where we are going together. And then our core values is really a definition of a few core principles that we hold near and dear. What are the things, the behaviors that we define that are so important internally that we are willing to hire and fire people against those behaviors? If somebody violates a core value, we're going to let them go because. That's something that we hold so important, we're not going to compromise that. Or we might have somebody who is really well credentialed that we're ready to hire, and they just have such good experience, but they don't quite fit in this core value. We're going to choose not to hire them as a result of that. And then ultimately, our objectives are our roadmap. And so that's what I was talking about a little bit earlier. Okay, so let's shift and talk about achieving goals. In terms of continuous performance management and employee experience, I mentioned earlier that goal setting is really important when it comes to employee experience because people can understand very clearly how they're fitting into the big picture. Goals ideally will be written down. They will be shared, not only between an employee and manager, but between peers and teams. They'll be updated regularly. And there'll be check-ins to assess performance and achievement against these goals. And I'm gonna share with you a, a little study that was done about goal best practices. And some of you may have seen this. This was actually originally done by Gail Matthews at Dominican University. She measured the behaviors or the actions of people in terms of their goal achievement. People who did not write down their goals, they only thought about them, achieved about 43%. But if they wrote down their goals and all the steps required to accomplish those goals, and they verbally committed to somebody else that they were going to accomplish this, and then they weighed in regularly with progress reports, they went up to 76% achievement. So for an organization, that's transformational. Uh, that means 
higher engagement between employees and managers because we're checking in regularly. It means that we're achieving more as an organization, as a company, about what's most important to us. And communication is just better all the way around. If, I, if I'm knowing what my peers are working on, it's a lot more meaningful than if I'm siloed and I'm off in my own world, just working on my own stuff. So that's a little bit about goal uh, achievement and goal setting and how that connects to employee experience. Now let's shift and talk about feedback. Feedback is, I would say, one of the number one, it is one of the top most important elements of an employee's experience. Everybody hears the, the expression, well, employees don't quit companies, they quit their manager. And often they quit their manager because they're not getting the feedback uh, that they desire. People want to know how they're doing and performing. Uh, this type of feedback should be written and verbal. It should be formal and informal. It should be both performance and development oriented. And ideally, it's going to be not just uh, between employees and managers, but it's going to be between peers. So if my colleague can help me in something and I can provide some feedback for them that will allow them to do that, that's gonna be very beneficial. And then we're also giving feedback among teams. How are we working? We're, we're not only talking about what we're working on, we're talking about how we're doing it. Are we doing it well? Are we having too many meetings? What are our, how could things improve as we work together as a team? So, and I'm just gonna give you some really compelling statistics about why feedback is so important. So <laughs> if you look at these, 28% of, and if you advance, there we go. 28% of employees receive meaningful feedback at least once a week. We have a lot of work to do, folks. That means that there's a huge percentage of organizations that managers need to be providing more meaningful feedback on a regular basis. 98% fail to be engaged when they don't get that feedback. Just do the math on that especially when it pertains to employee experience. 85% take more initiative when they receive feedback. Turnover is significantly lower and revenue is significantly higher. All right, so how do we go about building a structure of feedback in our organizations? Really one of the first ways is through regularly hosting quality one-to-one -one meetings. And this is where we have an expectation for every manager that this is part of their job, is to actually sit down and talk not only about what is being accomplished, but how things are going. And by doing that, experience and engagement will increase. When we're hosting these one-to-ones, we put them on the calendar. Employees know what they're about and that they are a different type of meeting. We're present, personal, professional, we're proactive. Uh, it's important to remember that when we're wanting to provide feedback, we ask permission. I don't know about you all, but I'm much more receptive if somebody comes to me and says, hey, Jeff, I have some information that could be helpful. Is it okay if I share it with you? Sure. Or I might say, ah, you know what? That's great, but I'm in the middle of like building this presentation and I'm under a deadline. Can we talk tomorrow morning? And all of a sudden, I've just learned as the giver of the feedback that we have a time that's going to be much more appropriate for this person and they're going to be more receptive. So ask for permission. Make sure that it's 180 degrees. So we have two way uh, discussions in our, our meetings. We're providing both development and coaching feedback and that it's feed forward. So we're not focused so much. You know, I showed you in the beginning that whole chronology of performance management. Much of that last 120 years time span has been this rear view mirror perspective on what's gone wrong for the employee. We need to tell them all the things that didn't go well. And continuous performance management is feed forward. It's a coaching 
conversation where it's much more development focused and that ends up creating a much better experience for everybody that's less anxiety provoking. So when we bring all this together, this is really about making sure that you're clear, crystal clear on who you are as an organization and where you're going and incorporating that into all aspects of how you run the business from onboarding to performance management, to customer and employee communications, goal setting and expectations. It's about creating more near-term goals, giving re real-time feedback, and by really setting the bar so that employees and managers will be engaged in communicating in a much more effective and meaningful way if you look at the alternative, it's it's not pretty. We're disengaged, we're not having those conversations and it ends up contributing to a very negative employee experience. So even though continuous performance management is only one aspect of the big picture, as Lori described a lot of other aspects in his, his portion of the talk, this is a vital, vital aspect of how an employee experiences your company. Um, now, Goalspan happens to be a software provider, um, and I always like to tell our clients that even though we are a continuous performance management software provider, software never is the single answer to this problem. It's a, it's a both and. Software is great, and it has to be enabled with these critical face-to-face -face, uh, conversations. So as a reminder, for those that are for-profit organizations, when you bring all of this together, you know, when you have a lot of revenue, it solves a lot of problems <laughs> in most, if you're a for-profit company. So companies with the best cultures and the high and the most highly appreciated employees, I guarantee you have the best employee experience and their revenue, at least according to Forbes, is higher as a result. So I will leave it there and I really appreciate everybody attending. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, thank you, Jeff. We've got some comments there. People love your goal setting slide um, and thought that re really resonated. I really liked what you were saying about asking for permission, even when it's something like feedback, just because you're so right when you put it like that. Sometimes people, a lot of times people do want feedback. They just might not be a good time for them to be able to act on it or like totally like focus on accepting what it is you're going to say. So just that simple act of just asking is super, super appreciated, I think, in a workplace. Awesome. And another point from Dolores, excellent explanations and thank you, Jeff. So well done. We're going to start the wrapping up of today's session now. Um, and so we just want to end off with a few key takeaways. We each picked one. Lori says, make promises, not perks. And Jeff says, if there's one thing you take away from him, it's align your workforce. And on my end, I just included a nice quote that I've been seeing right recently around the topic of change and uncertainty, how clarity is kindness from Brene Brown. Oh, nope. And we want to kick off a poll here. Let me just pull it up. Awesome. Yes. So um, as I mentioned prior, this is one of our first times doing a session like this where we have two different presentations addressing the same topic just to come from different perspectives. And so we're very curious to see what you thought of a format like this. And of course, in sharing in the chat, if there's something that um, particularly resonated with you, we'd love to hear um, in the chat box as well. So we know what to do more of in the future or even what to do less of in the future. So all of your feedback is just greatly appreciated. And I'll leave that up for a few moments longer. And now we'll, um, Jeff and Lori and I thought it'd be great for us to just give a brief little spiel on, give a bit more context about what it is we do and how we're here today. And so on my end, Bucket List, we just love the topic of employee experience. It's something that's near and dear to our hearts. And we believe that recognition is just such a great way to help with employee experience in the workplace because it just really helps people feel that sense of belonging and that they're valued and seen. And we are just super passionate about helping people build workplace cultures that will support 
UN challenges like lowering turnover, making sure people feel recognized and bring your staff together through engaging rewards and recognition programs. And so I will just be launching a poll. And if you are curious in learning more, um, feel free to let us know. And in the same poll, I've also included one for Within People and Goals fans. So I'll leave that open as uh, pass things off to Lori. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. Um, yeah, Within People, we're a, a partnership that works all over the world. We're based um, <clears throat> around North America and Europe and South Africa and, and in um, Hong Kong and Singapore. Our main joy is helping people make their cultures really powerful tools to grow more purposeful companies. And to do that, we help them understand what that culture really is, um, how to make it and bring it to life through every part of the employee experience and how to support leaders to be able to lead it with um, real confidence as well. Awesome, and Jeff? Yes, um, so Goalspan, our main mission is to help organization, help people work better together. And we help them align their workforce around what's most important. And we do that through goal setting, continuous feedback, assessments, and surveys, and performance reviews. Um, we have customers in 12 countries, and we integrate with over 30 of your favorite HR and payroll apps. And I put in the chat, uh, how you can connect with us, as Rebecca mentioned initially, I also have a podcast called Human Capital, which you can listen to on all platforms. And that link is in the chat as well as a presentation I'm hosting on July 13th at 10 a.m. on improving performance with AI. So there's a link in the chat to register for that if you're interested. And that's a little bit about Goalspan. Awesome. Thank you both, Lori and Jeff. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, um, aside from, of course, our presentations, here are the professional development credits for the session. Um, if you're dialing in, I'll just, by phone, I can just read the credits out right now real quickly. So for HRCI, it's 633273. And for SHRM, it's 23-H7P9Q. Um, we'll also be sending this out over email after the fact. So if you don't have it now, no worries. And I'll also just drop it in the chat box as we head on over to Q&A. Awesome. So we did get a few questions in during the session, but I believe they've been answered. So we can just hop on straight to the questions that people submitted beforehand. Thank you in advance for sending us such thoughtful questions. We really appreciate it. Um, I know we just have a couple minutes left here today, so I'll pick our top few here. So this one I'll toss to Lori first. Lori, um, in your experience, how can middle managers impact or create a positive culture when um, maybe senior leaders need a bit more support around that? Oh, that's a really juicy one. I think first thing I'd say is that everybody gets to impact a culture, not just the senior leaders. The culture is the responsibility and accountability of everybody in an organization. Sure, senior leaders have a bigger impact over it, but for, to start with, for middle managers to understand that their own behavior and their own ways of showing up are incredibly powerful, probably the, some of the most influential in terms of how the employee experience is actually felt by the majority of employees. Um, I think inviting accountability from senior leaders, asking them to start to, to understand better with curiosity kind of what they're committed to, what they feel is most important to them, and being in a place to support those leaders to understand what's needed from them, rather than kind of bearing a grudge and not inviting that feedback. Awesome. And Jeff, to end this off, what are your thoughts on this subject? I would really hone in on trust. Uh, the, the more managers can develop trust with their employees, then the better 
communication will be and the better the employee experience. And I'm really talking about vulnerability-based trust, not predictive trust, which is that if you've shown up at 8 a.m. every morning for the past two years, you're going to show up tomorrow at 8 a.m. It's more like, if I share with you something difficult, are you going to hold that against me? And if the answer is no, because we're on the same team, those are higher levels of trust. So I would always start with trust. Awesome. Well, thank you both. We are at the hour, impeccable timing on both your parts. Um, thank you everyone for joining in today. We really appreciate your time and love getting to know you all a bit more and hear more about your experiences. And we hope that you enjoyed as much as we did and we hope to see you the next one. Bye now, take care.